Hi, and welcome to another episode of Access Chat. Delighted to have Andrew Imperato with us today. Andrew is the director of AUCD and has a long and varied history working in the field of accessibility and inclusion, uh, particularly in the States where he has done an awful lot of work. So we're really, really glad to have you here today, Andrew. It's, it's an honor for us to have you on Access Chat. Um, and I'm very keen to learn what you're doing in, in the field of higher education and, and bringing together networks of people um, to focus around improving the rights for people with disabilities and access, etc. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about what AUCD is and, and, and the work that you've been doing? Sure, thank you. It's great to be on. I really appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate your all's leadership and Kind of keeping this conversation going globally. It's really exciting to be able to be part of the conversation. Um, so I, I'm a disability rights lawyer by training. I have bipolar disorder or manic depression myself, which I've been open about throughout my career. And um, I'm kind of a policy wonk in terms of what, what I've done professionally since coming to Washington 22 years ago. Um, AUCD is the Association of University Centers on Disabilities, which is a national organization based in the Washington, D.C. area. And we represent a network of university-based centers all around the United States. We have at least one in every state and territory. I'm speaking to you today from Austin, Texas, where I'm being hosted by my center here at the University of Texas. And um, the center at the University of Texas is kind of an interesting example because they're one of 19 university centers in our network who have an assistive technology grant for their state. So they are promoting technology accessibility, both universal design and access to assistive technology. They're letting people come and try out different technology and they're doing it across the lifespan, you know, from early childhood to people who are aging and are trying to find the right technology to, to maintain their independence as, um, as seniors. So um, one way to think about our network is it's a $650 million research and development arm for the disability field. Uh, we have a lot of PhDs and MDs. We have scientists. We have hard science scientists, and we have um, social scientists, uh, a lot of people with expertise in early childhood, K through 12 education, inclusive higher education for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities, self-determination for adults with developmental disabilities. Um, they get involved in testing out model programs and evaluating them. And uh, we do a lot of leadership development across lots of different disciplines. So it's, a, it's an interesting network. And many of our centers are doing international work. A uh, good example is our center. One of our centers up in Boston is called the Institute for Community Inclusion. And they do employment work all around the world uh, with a strong emphasis on employment for people with more significant disabilities. But they have a project in Beijing. They have a project in Tokyo. They have a project in Saudi America. And, it, and if you look at all of our centers, I'm guessing that um, we're probably touching over 100 countries in terms of the work that they're doing outside the United States. Wow. That's, 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 that's a large remit. Very large sum of money to in terms of putting together the the research. So is is that funded through the the, the partner organisations through the universities or or how how do you bring together that kind of significant funding, which is really really important, um, to bring that to bear on 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 the focus of research and, and, and so on because. Absolutely, it needs to be done, but quite often that that funding is specific grants um, looking at little areas, and it can be quite fragmented, as we've seen with a lot of the EU Framework 7 and uh, before that fixed framework grant funding is it would specify a particular project, and once that project was done, yeah. it, it all disappears, whereas this sounds like it's much more... Um, focused and centered on, on, on achievable um, goals. And that sounds interesting to me. I'm curious to know more. 
Yeah, it's, it's an interesting model. So our, our network was created by Eunice Kennedy Shriver and President Kennedy. It was the, the last bill that he signed um, created our network back in the, in the early 60s. And the, the vision was, you know, Eunice had a sister and the president had a sister, Rosemary, who had an intellectual disability. And she wanted, you know, the Kennedy years were kind of the best and the brightest years. And I think so her, her context was she wanted to get smart people at universities focused on how to change the world for children with intellectual disabilities. And she was focused on children initially. And then over time, our network started to get involved with the, you know, the, the disability issues across the lifespan. Um, so, you know, originally there were like 15 centers and they, they each got a core grant. Now there are 67 university centers for excellence in developmental disabilities, at least one in every state and territory. And they each get a core grant of $535,000 a year from the Administration on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, which is part of our mm -hmm. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, what's interesting is the average size of a USED, again, keep in mind their core grant is 535000 the average size of a USED is $7 million. So what they do is they take their core funding and they leverage that with strong encouragement from their federal funders. They leverage it to go after other funding. And some of them have major projects with their state governments where the state is providing funding to help solve problems that the state is concerned about. Um, some of them are getting funding from other federal agencies or other parts of the Department of Health and Human Services. We have a big relationship with the Maternal and Child Health Bureau to help train the professionals that are gonna go into serving children with developmental disabilities and their families. Big relationship with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention working on health promotion um, and the kinds of things that CDC, you know, focuses on. And then we have a big relationship with the National Institutes of Health, which is what's funding a lot of our hard science research. So we have 15 centers that are doing basic brain science research with grants from NIH. So it's a diversified model. One of the things that I'm bringing to the organization is more private sector business uh, relationships. You mentioned Frances West. She was on my board when I was at the American Association of People with Disabilities. And, and most of our funding came from corporations like IBM and Walmart and AT&T and other large global companies. So I know how to build those relationships and deliver value. And, and I feel like my network can deliver a lot more value than I was able to when I was at APD. So I'm kind of excited about the potential for us to go from being a $650 million network to a billion dollar network with a lot of the new money coming from the private sector, from the business community. That sounds fascinating and, and a really interesting opportunity. From my point of view, I completely understand. I work for one of those large businesses. Uh, my role's analogous to that of Francis. And we're looking to uh, always find ways of, of working with partners in government and, and, and to solve the problems that, that, that government is unable to solve on its own. And quite often that involves working with academia. So in, in the UK we work with um, a number of universities uh, um, and have partnership programs to do the kind of stuff that, that, that you're talking about. Uh, I'm really impressed at the scale, though. I think the scale's the scale's really impressive, uh, and and also just uh, the kind of deep research is also really important because of what I I've, I've seen previously, uh, and what I still see previously is uh, calls for isolated problems to be solved, and, and I think that I'm really really interested in the fact that you are talking about dealing with issues across people throughout people's lifespans because that's something that doesn't happen now we have areas of excellence within different countries there is fantastic provision but it is always patchy we've always got so in the in the UK at, at university level at, at higher education level you get fantastic support um, in terms of assistive technology um, for 
all kinds of things, tutor support, uh, mentoring, all of this kind of stuff, really well uh, established program. Mm -hmm. But you've got to get through all of your K through 12 education first. So effectively, it's only the ones that have developed coping strategies or have had people that are willing to pay yeah. that, that then get this help. So the fact that you're taking it right from, right from the onset is really important. Uh, Antonio, I know you've got a question. Uh, yes, I do. Um, uh, I, um, I've been following up some of the developments in relation with the digital, digital government in the, in the United States and some of the initiatives that, that, that have been rolled out. So I'm curious to know how your organization is connecting with the government digital services in the United States to promote accessibility, uh, not only, you know, to have sites accessible, but to make sure w that every initiative that digital gov is taking is also aligned w with accessibility? Yeah, that's a great question. So it helps that we're based in Washington, D.C. Um, immediately before this job, I was the Disability Policy Director for the United States Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, which is the committee that has jurisdiction over civil rights in lots of environments. The jurisdiction around digital accessibility is kind of complicated. Um, we have a number of committees in the United States Congress that have pieces of that. If you're talking specifically about how the government does business, um, there's a provision in the Rehabilitation Act, which is under the jurisdiction of the Health Committee, but there are also other committees that um, have jurisdiction over the federal government. So. Um, just as an example of different ways that we're interacting with, uh, with our national government, um, there's a federal agency called the Architectural and Transportation Barriers Compliance Board or the Access Board, which sets the standards for accessibility nationally under the Americans with Disabilities Act, under Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, which is the provision that deals with technology accessibility when the government is the purchaser. Um, and the person who Obama appointed to that uh, board, who's now the chair of that board, works for my center in Utah. Uh, his name is Sachin Pavithran. He's a blind man who um, grew up in Dubai and works uh, in Logan, Utah at our University Center for Excellence there and runs the assistive technology project for the state of Utah. Um, so Sachin is very, very centrally involved in advocating for accessibility and in his role as chair of this regulatory agency, you know, he's trying to make sure that they're providing guidance and support in the areas where it's most needed. Um, we've had lots of good, when I was working for Senator Harkin, we had a hearing on technology accessibility in higher education and we had um, people from the U.S. Department of Justice come and testify. Um, Interestingly, the Obama civil rights officials have been really, really good in a lot of areas, but the level of leadership around technology accessibility has been relatively weak, and it's been a real sore spot for the blindness community and other groups, the deaf community, other groups in the United States that have been very focused on it. I would also say overall, and Deborah, feel free to chime in here, but I would say overall, um, the United States has not taken accessibility for people with intellectual disabilities, brain injuries, schizophrenia, you know, other types of mental disabilities very seriously in the sense that we don't have very strong regulations around that, certainly compared to accessibility for people who are blind or deaf or hard of hearing. Um, and, you know, frankly, I think we've underinvested in really figuring out um, how to measure accessibility for people with mental disabilities in a way that is meaningful and kind of making the business case for why that level of accessibility ends up being better designed for, for all users. I totally agree, totally agree with you. And I think some of the problems we're seeing um, across the United States are results of us not really making that a priority. So, for example, you know, when the Access Board set the standards under Section 508, which they then have, um, you know, tried to refresh, um, they actually explicitly decided not to set any standards around cognitive disability accessibility, in part because they didn't know how to measure it. 
So instead of really figuring that out, they just kind of punted. And I know, you know, people like the folks at the Web Accessibility Initiative, um, you know, up in Boston were frustrated that there wasn't more leadership from the Access Board on that on those sets of issues. For some reason, my uh, audio has cut off, so I'm not hearing Neil. I'm not yeah. hearing. Right. I, yeah. Can you hear me I, now? I, I yes. couldn't yeah. hear y'all either, yeah. but I just heard okay. Antonio. Yeah, so, Neil can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it's frustrating for me because uh, I have a cognitive disability. I, I'm dyslexic. I actually, as an Englishman, tried to interfere in, in 508. So I, I, I put forward a proposal through the... Uh, through W3C Web Accessibility Initiative for some wording to, to include at least some kind of provision for cognitive uh, as part of the refresh, because we don't want to wait another 17 years. Even, even though it's not a law that directly affects me, everyone across the world is indirectly affected by 508, because all of the software companies that, that we work with if they're going to audit against something, they're going to produce a VPAT, uh, and that's 508. So, so it's really crucially important that that this stuff does does get an airing, and I think it is galling that that it's not had such an airing so far. Understandably, it's easier to to solve problems that are technical than ones that are fuzzy, uh, and and certainly. Um, as, as Deborah and I both know, as members of the, the Cognitive Accessibility Task Force, the, the, the problems are really fuzzy because if you, one cognitive disability will have different needs to another, and they quite often conflict as well. well I think an interesting example is a smartphone. Yeah. Um, you know, if you pick up a smartphone, generally it's not very intuitive how to turn it on, how to get it functioning, uh, how to make a phone call. Um, how to, you know, look for an email, whatever it is you're trying to do, even the camera oftentimes is not intuitive. So that's a good example where I think if the designers of these very kind of important everyday devices were forced to think hard about how somebody, you know, with a third grade reading level might, you know, access the device, we would come up with ways of doing the functionality in these devices that are more intuitive and I think would lead to a larger market of people who are comfortable using the devices. I mean, my mother is 85. She's still very active professionally, but she has a lot of discomfort with an iPhone. She literally just got an iPhone. One of my cousins went with her to pick it up and he gives her weekly tutorials on it. But we should have a smartphone you know, device that doesn't require weekly tutorials for 85 year olds. Uh, agree. Uh, my mum, my, my, I've just had my parents here, they're in their 70s, and uh, one of the first things they do is hand me the iPad, saying, <laughs> here's a list of things I need you to show me. <laughs> they want to do it, but, um, but yes, it needs to be more intuitive. And actually, I think to give the, the system designers their, their credit, and be, to be fair, some of it's not that bad. Some of it's not that intu um, unintuitive. But what is a real problem for people with cognitive disabilities, and particularly with short-term memory problems, is the frequent updates. Yeah. It's like coming home and finding someone's rearranged all of the furniture in your house while you're away. Yeah, great point. Yeah, so um, so that's the biggest problem for for that I see among the aging population for using these kind of devices. It's the fact that it can, you can learn it and it can all be taken away from you in an instant. Deborah, I know you've got a question. Yes, and, and right in this line of thinking, one, one of my clients, um, they call the older people laggers. And my mom also, my mom just got an iPhone 6. Um, it's gonna be arrive in the mail on Tuesday. And it, I, I, you know, of course, that that company is not calling them a lag, lagger out loud to anybody, but that's what they call them. In 
internally. And so, and the reality is these devices, it, it should work for all of us. You don't have to label us as useless laggers, old, you know, but so I, I think we really, really do have um, an opportunity to, um, to build devices, build technology, so that um, it benefits society as a whole, regardless of whether we have a disability, we're older, we're cognitively challenged. I, um, it, it, you know, so I think we have a real opportunity there. But the question I have for Andy is, I know that Andy worked a lot with one of our really great senators, Senator um, Harkin, and um, who's now retired, but did great, great, great work for us in, um, in this field, but, and was very active in trying to get the United States to pass the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And I was just wondering if you, you know, you know, have any thoughts on, could some of that, the, those activities support some of the um, problems that we've seen in the United States, but also globally? Sure. Um, well, you're right that um, Senator Harkin was very focused on getting the U.S. to be a party to the convention. Again, there was an interesting jurisdictional issue. The Senate committee that has jurisdiction over treaties is the Foreign Relations Committee. Senator Harkin was not a member of that committee, but because he had so much passion around disability issues, he kind of inserted himself into the process and testified in support of U.S. ratification in front of that committee, which was somewhat unusual for a senator to testify in front of other committees um, or in front of any Senate committee. But, um, you know, I think, you know, people in other countries, I think, oftentimes have a hard time understanding why would the U.S. not become a party to this convention when the convention was based in part on U.S. law and U.S. experience in framing disability as a civil rights or a human rights issue. And, you know, I think there are lots of reasons for it. You know, part of it is just the nature of our politics, you know, in the United States. You, you have to have a two-thirds vote pursuant to our Constitution to become a party to the convention, a two-thirds vote in the Senate, which translates to 67 out of 100 senators. And it's very, very, very difficult to get 67 senators to agree to anything that has the word UN in it. Um, in, the, in the United States, um, the UN is perceived by a lot of Republicans and a lot of conservatives as kind of a French-dominated, effete institution that's trying to tell us macho United States people what to do. <laughs> Um, and and it, it it doesn't it doesn't take much uh, to take to kind of get Republicans up in arms about a UN convention, and then you add to that uh, there's a group of parents in the United States who've elected to homeschool their children, meaning they don't send their children to public schools, but they educate them at home, and parents do this for lots of different reasons, but there is a homeschool legal defense association which has a very strong relationship with that set of parents, and they um, argued vociferously to their members that if we were to become a party to this convention, the United Nations would come along and tell them they can't homeschool their children with disabilities anymore. Um, it was a completely fallacious argument, but it was very believable for the parents that were in this network, and they got very activated. Um, at one point, there were 50 calls just in the state of Iowa. There were 50 calls from homeschool parents against the convention for every one call that Senator Harkin received in support of the convention. So, so to some degree, we got way out organized by the opposition. Now, having said all of that, I still think the United States will become a party to this convention. I'm, I'm a glass half full person. I think there were a lot of positives that happened around the U.S. advocacy that we can build on. We have some really important Republicans who are supporting the convention, like Kelly Ayotte, who's a young Republican senator from a swing state. She's from New Hampshire. Um, if she kind of can get reelected and stay in the Senate, she could be in the Senate for another 20, 30 years. And I think um, if we can keep her connected to this issue, she will eventually prevail. I really feel like this whole... Tea Party thing will, will work itself out over time. In some ways, this is the last gasp yeah, of, of uh, you know, people who don't like the way that our country is changing, but I, I don't think that they're going to be able to stop the change from happening. 
So um, my hope is that, you know, the coalition that worked on the convention, which was very bipartisan, the veterans organizations that worked on it, the faith-based organizations that worked on it, the business groups, and interestingly, most of the business groups that were most active on it, like in IBM, were technology companies. Um, and I just feel like all of these different players, eventually the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, they will not be ignored forever by the United States Senate. And eventually, I think we will become a party to the convention. And I think that even when, while we're not a party to the convention, we can continue to work with the rest of the world on defining what disability means from a civil and human rights standpoint. We may not be able to be represented on the committee that's overseeing implementation, but we can certainly share our expertise and try to come together with the world as a partner to figure out the issues that we still haven't figured out. And, and we've talked about some of those issues, but there are lots of them. You always amaze me, Andy. We are so blessed to have you as a leader in our country. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm still laughing because I work for a French company. So <laughs> your description of the UN is a little closer <laughs> to home than, than you might have first realized. Um, <laughs> so um, I think it's, it, it's, it is fascinating. And, it, and, and also, I, I applaud you for your long term view. It's, it's something that, that I absolutely with you on because whilst the electorate, uh, sorry, the, the you know, politicians may change and rotate, you know, we need to keep on pushing and, and, and you change the environment within which people get elected. Uh, and, and that's not a short term thing. You know, we're, we're all in it for the long haul. Um, hopefully some of the stuff we do will um, have a reaction that's quicker and a result that's quicker. You know, I'm, I'm amazed at what's happened through social media. I think it acts as a, an enormous catalyst. There's so much that's happened in the last few years that, that wouldn't have happened before. I think it's really powerful. Uh, mm -hmm. But likewise, we still need to be mindful that legislation certainly doesn't change overnight. Antonio, you've got another question. Yes, is um, uh, related with technology and some of the latest developments that we see coming in in the Internet of Things and shared economy. So I would like to uh, know and see Andrew's views on on the development of shared economy of companies like Uber and the Internet of Things and about the implementation of accessibility in those two areas. Yeah, that's a great question and it's something that um, you know I would say we're still trying to figure out in the United States and I'm sure globally. Um, full disclosure, you know, I'm somebody who has used Uber happily and used Airbnb happily. So those would be two examples of the, the shared economy that I think you're talking about. And I definitely see the power of them. Um, you know, I think part of this is a culture clash between kind of a Silicon Valley dominated kind of cowboy venture capital culture and a Washington dominated regulatory nanny state culture. <laughs> um, and to, to the extent that um, Uber sees themselves as primarily a technology company and therefore um, not subject to the same kind of regulations or restrictions that would apply to a transportation company, I feel like that's kind of a silly distinction. I mean, I think ultimately Uber is a technology company, it's a transportation company, it's many things, and I'm sure over time it will diversify what it is. Um, but um, I think they make a mistake when they assume that they don't have to think about um, how to make their, their delivery system work for people with a wide range of disabilities in a way that's reasonable given their business model. So, like, simple things like training the drivers um, as part of their orientation so that they know that it's not okay for them to refuse to pick up a person in a wheelchair who can transfer from their wheelchair into the vehicle so that they know that it's not okay to refuse to pick up somebody with a service dog. I mean, those are pretty basic things. Does that mean every Uber driver will comply with the law? No. Um, 
but yeah. are they are they getting quality training as part of their orientation? Um, it doesn't seem like they are in every market. Um, and when Uber responds to public criticism around these things, I have found they're pretty ham-handed in their response. They don't seem to have a deep understanding of disability as a civil rights issue. They have important leaders in the United States in the disability community who are supporting them. I know a lot of blind people who love Uber and find it much more accessible from a blind standpoint than using a regular taxi system. So, and it's also for many people much more affordable than using a regular taxi system. So my attitude towards the technologies is that they're not gonna go away and they, they're transforming you know, kind of um, how we get uh, individualized rides and how we find affordable lodging when we go to other parts of the country. So the question for us as disability advocates is how can we work with them to make their technology work for us? And I feel that um, taking a heavy-handed regulatory approach is probably not the best strategy taking a kind of a helping them reach a bigger market approach is probably ultimately a better strategy. But, you know, I think we're still trying to figure this out. I have a question about uh, I agree. Uh, six by 15, because uh, this is, this is something that uh, I'm interested in also. So this is uh, a campaign that you're running based sure. on the, 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 the anniversary for the ADA and the, yeah. So can you tell us a bit more about about this campaign? Sure. So, um, you know, a uh, couple of years ago, as we were kind of thinking about the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, it occurred to me that it might be useful to have some goals that we can put out there as, as a kind of a broad disability community of things that we care about that we would like to achieve by the end of 2015. So the kind of the big goal that we started with was actually a goal that Senator Harkin set in 2011. Um, we have monthly numbers from the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the United States that tell us the size of the working age population in the United States who have a disability who are in the workforce. And that means they either have earned income or they're actively looking for a job. And that number peaked in 2008 at 5.8 million. Right now, it's a little over 5 million. At one point, it was down around 4.6 million. So we lost a lot of jobs. Um, and, and Senator Harkin set a goal. Let's try to, and again, he did this in 2011 and said, let's try to get back to where we were and then add another uh, couple hundred thousand. So we, we wanted 6 million people in the labor force by the end of this year. And then we set related goals around high school graduation rates, around kind of health promotion, around early childhood screening and follow up, around community living. Um, and, you know, the, the goals were really um, intended to kind of show that there was unity in the United States about outcomes that matter. So we had six national groups launch the goals, including big groups like Special Olympics business-oriented groups like the U.S. Business Leadership Network, which is why I'm in Austin right now. They're having their national conference. And then we put it out there for others to endorse it, and I think we're up to over 160 organizations that have endorsed the goals. Um, but there was no budget for it. I mean, this was really just something that came out of my brain, and, and we weren't able to put a lot of resources behind it. So, it, you know, it, it was. I think it was good in terms of getting people to focus on what we all agree on, but it hasn't been as good in terms of really generating a lot of organic activity on the ground. Um, so I'm trying to evaluate what we can learn from this campaign. I think in some ways it was too complicated. You know, that's what happens when a lawyer with bipolar disorder tries to come up with a <laughs> campaign. Um, but, um, but I'd like to do something a little bit easier, a little bit simpler and generate more activity around 2020 or whatever our next kind of big milestone anniversary might be. Okay. Thank you so much. It's been a fascinating interview. I, I learned a lot again. It's one of the great things about Access Chat is every week we learn something new. Uh, really pleased to have you on and um, looking forward to the Twitter chat to, tomorrow night. Thank you again. Thank you. Great. Like, likewise, thanks for the opportunity. And thanks tomorrow for afternoon.
Yeah, for us it's the afternoon. And thank you to all three of you for your leadership on these issues. That you know, as a person with a disability, I really appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you being here too. So uh, it's mutual. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.